Hey everyone, welcome to our online service. Join us as we worship.
Praise Jesus, our God is greater. Father, we praise you and we acknowledge that you are greater. You are above all things. You are sovereign God, God in charge, and we worship you. Thank you, Father. Nothing is impossible for you. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we thank you for the hope that is in you. You can overcome anything. There is hope for you. He is with you. He is your defender, advocate, fighter. He's fighting your battles. What an awesome, awesome truth again once, once uh, once again, Romans 8.15, For you did not receive the spirit of bondage, again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption, by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit Himself bears witness with your spirit that we are children of God. God is is a father to you. He's your daddy. And did you know that you're safe in his arms? He's for you. He's faithful. So Father, we just love you. We honor you. We praise you. Lord, would you come again and fill us Fill us with your spirit. We need you, Jesus. We can't do anything without you, Lord. Fill us afresh again this Sunday morning. Spirit of truth made abide in us. Thank you for the mind of Christ. Hallelujah. Father, I pray that you would do what you can only do, encourage, speak, refresh and all of us this Sunday morning again, God. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. God is for you. That's a word. That's a word for you. Well, before we continue here in, with worship, a few uh, quick announcements. First of all, uh, right after this service, online service, we're going to have our town hall meeting on Zoom, and that will begin at 12 p.m., so right after this service at 12 p.m. Easter is coming very, very soon, and we're going to have some awesome stuff coming up uh, on Tuesday. This coming Tuesday, uh, we're going to continue our live prayer sessions at 7 p.m., live prayer sessions through YouTube online. And then, a celebration is at hand. Good Friday at 4 p.m. We're going to finally gather together in person at 4 p.m. So that's going to be something exciting, something that I'm sure many of us are looking forward to. So again, 4 p.m. And then Sunday, Easter Sunday, um, uh, regular service in-house again, in person at 10.30 a.m. So great that we can come together again in person. And of course, we're going to be live streaming them as well. So if you're not able to come, you can uh, join through live streaming. And lastly, thank you for your giving. You can continue to do so 
through the various different options you, the, you see there on the screen. God bless you as you're sowing in, giving into the ministry of Salem and into blessing the kingdom of God in Thunder Bay. And we're going to continue now with uh, worship and, and uh, join us and, and, and worship there at home and, and have your focus on Jesus, have your mind set on Jesus. And after that, we're going to have, we're excited to have Caitlin to uh, share a testimony with, uh, with us. And then Matt is going to share an awesome word uh, with us as well. I believe in 
the saints' communion and in your holy church. I believe in the resurrection when Jesus comes again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. I believe in God our Father. I believe in Christ the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection that we will rise again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. Oh, the name of Jesus. We believe in you. the Son, I believe in the Our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection that we will rise again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. So power in the name of Jesus We confess with our mouth Jesus you are Lord We say that you are Lord Caitlin Coach and I'm going to share my story with you. So I guess my story kind of starts out with my parents. My dad is this Canadian guy who is um, known to call himself redneck sometimes and my mom is this Minnesota girl who got her college degree and, and kind of grew up more of a city girl and so I guess I'm kind of like this hybrid and um, I have two older siblings so it kind of put me in this position throughout my life of kind of being mature in some ways that maybe people who weren't in my position um, were. And so starting out in elementary school, you know, I wasn't, in my mind, I wasn't quite as mature as I kind of got in high school when it came to school-wise, but I often found that it was hard to kind of be on the inside of the circle sometimes in social ways. I don't think it was linked to the maturity thing, but I think it was just like something that was part of who I was. And and so sometimes I guess that was a bit of a lonely place to be in. And then you fast forward to grade 10 and grade 10 was a really interesting year for me. God just really like picked me up and, and did things that I wasn't expecting. And um, he really just conquered all the fear that I had that year and was literally <laughs> like a, a lifesaver for me as he has been throughout my entire life. And so after that point, I was just a lot more focused on God. You know, it went from church being just, you know, what we did on Sunday to church being something where I enjoyed it and I, I would listen and I would pay attention. And um, so then going into about grade 12, I kind of started to figure out like, what am I gonna do? What am I gonna be? Kind of around, you know, summer after grade 12, I ended up um, deciding it was the best option for me to just take a year off and I felt like that was what God wanted me to do and so that's what I did and um, I had a teacher who told me don't take any more years off other than one because you'll just keep on taking years off and I was like okay and kind of thought that's what I would do because I like to learn and so you fast forward to now and I guess this is like my fourth year off 
but I don't consider it like that because what I was able to do in the last four years is understand what I wanted and God really led me in, in understanding what I wanted to be. You know, the last four or so years that I've taken off, the way that God has supplied for me and sometimes it's been hard when people ask me what I'm doing because I'm not getting a bachelor's degree or I'm not, you know, becoming a doctor and some of those things, they sound so exciting and glamorous. But instead, I've just been able to really understand who my Father God is and then in turn understand who I am. And it has been the greatest blessing. I was telling my brother the other day in his pickup truck, which I think is where a lot of the best conversations go down, um, about how, you know, in the last year, I've seen God supply for me this kind of happiness that, I mean, before I would have said I was a happy person but he's transformed my life to be even happier in ways that I hadn't imagined. And that honestly has just come through <laughs> being with him a lot and spending a lot of time in his word, which I think is incredibly vital. It literally provides life and joy and hope and healing. But also I've had to sacrifice a lot and I've had to give up a lot. I've been able to find greater joy in things that are so simplistic. You know, just going to a grocery store, going for a walk. I've been able to see those things just like do something different inside of me to provide me with joy that is just hard to express. You know, that godly joy that is just like, you just can't put it into words. I've seen that happen and it's only because of Jesus Christ. So I think just to sum up my story, you know, when I look to the future, I look to it with hope and I don't know exactly what everything God is going to do for me, but God has conquered my fear, He's conquered my doubts, He's conquered death, He's conquered sin in my life. You know, like everybody else, we have fallen short of the glory of God and made mistakes, but God is entirely capable of handling, handling every single situation and every single person. It doesn't matter what your past looks like but it's so important to keep looking ahead. You don't drive with your head turned around looking out the rearview mirror, you look forwards. Well, hey, good morning. Good to see everybody. Even though I can't see you, I'm, I'm sure you're, you're somewhere this morning. And so glad you're, you're watching, tuning in, wherever you're tuning in from. And uh, we're gonna get right into this. I'm going to speak about something that I haven't spoke on in a few years now, so I'm really happy about this, really uh, glad to be able to share this with you. Something that's been burning on my heart for a few weeks, and I was actually uh, supposed to speak it a little bit ago. Uh, some things came up, and so now I'm glad to have this opportunity to share with you today. Um, and we're going to look at worship so it's a topic that I'm really passionate about. I love to talk about worship. I love to share what's on my heart about worship. Um, but before we get into that, um, I want to first give a little bit of an introduction of who I am. You know, personally, I believe that, you know, when someone is giving a teaching on a topic, you know, not to say that this person has to be an expert or anything, uh, but I just believe that, you know, the person sharing should have some uh, experience with what they're talking about. And many that are hearing me today uh, already know me and some may not. Uh, but here's a little bit of background on who I am. So my story of worship, from the time I can remember, even when I can't, worship and music has always been a huge part of my life. You know, I remember holding my dad's guitar when I was, you know, just age of three, you know, holding on my lap, and I couldn't even hold it properly because it was too big. And then at age four, I started playing piano. Age 11, I started playing guitar. And I started playing guitar on, on the worship team here when I was 12, and I've been involved with the music ministry here ever since at Salem. I received Jesus into my life the first time when I was three, and I remember my first encounter with the Lord at a Bible camp. Thank you, Lord, for Bible camp. Amen. Uh, when I was seven at Bible camp, I encountered the Lord. And I've encountered the Lord many times in worship. But really it started in my teenage years, uh, where my eyes really got open to this world of worship. I remember one summer when I was in the ninth grade. You know, my friend and I would spend hours and hours worshiping together. We would have our guitars and, and we would worship, sometime even till the sun came up. Experience the presence of God in a really real way. 
I was 16 the first time I was actually asked to lead worship. And the youth pastor had me, asked me to, you know, lead a few songs. And it was actually more like me just kind of <laughs> sitting in a corner, just strumming some, you know, songs and singing and, and hoping that others would kind of join along with me. And there's a lot more I could say about worship. Um, but that was the start of my journey. And, you know, the rest is just history. The rest is just gone and, and grown from there. And so I've learned a lot over the years about worship, and I've experienced a lot in worship, in my times with the Lord in worship. And I'm always learning and growing. I always desire to learn and to grow in this area. And through God's grace, for the last 10 years, I've been uh, the leader here of the music ministry at Salem. And I love to do it. It's the best job in the world. Uh, so that's a little bit about me. So now back onto the topic of worship. And this is a really huge topic. So we're going to go in a, a little bit narrow this morning. And I want to look at with you uh, what the purpose of worship is. You know, another way we could say it is, you know, why do we worship? What is worship good for? Or we can say, you know, um, why is it a good thing? We're going to look at this from two different angles or perspectives. Um, we can look at the purpose of worship both individually and corporately. So in looking at the purpose of worship or the why of worship, I want to start first of all by quickly setting a foundation for what worship actually is. I think many times we can overcomplicate what worship is. Just as we can overcomplicate, you know, something like prayer, what prayer looks like sometimes, which prayer is simply talking to God. We tend to think about these big extravagant prayers where in fact prayer is just God calling us to connect with him, with his heart. And it gets deeper, but that's the, that's the starting place. Um, just talking to God, which is an invitation for us and a privilege. It's the same with worship. I believe we overcomplicate worship because of the appearance that worship has been given, especially these recent years. When we look at, you know, often we look at the external expressions of worship. You know, we look at the sound, the visuals, the songs, um, the, the physical expressions of worship, whether it be dance or lifting hands or singing. All these things are good when they're in their right place. But worship at the core comes down to a heart that longs for Jesus, that we focus and center our hearts on him. Worship is simply just loving God. If you love God, you are a worshiper. Worship is not so much about what we do for God, it's our love toward him. It's so much more of an inward thing than an outward expression. But then, what happens is the outward expression will be a natural overflow of our posture of worship. You know, worship means worth-ship, I've heard it said. You know, giving worth to something. Seeing uh, everything we worship, everyone will worship someone or something. But God commands and desires for us to worship him alone. From the beginning, God has always desired his people to worship him. In Exodus 8, 1, the Lord said to Moses, go to Pharaoh and say to him, this is what the Lord says, let my people go so that they may worship me. We were created and designed for worship. I believe even our, even our physical DNA, the very fabric of our being, gives glory to God. This is our identity, to worship him. And out of our identity of life, a life of worship will follow, where everything that we do, say, think, or sometimes even feel, should be directed as worship to God. So that's what worship is, giving worth to God because we love him. It's simple, but it's amazing truth. Um, it's, uh, it's just such a big and important thing in our lives. And so let's not overcomplicate it. Worship is not music. 
And so to go on with the rest of this teaching, I want to just make this really clear. Worship is not music. Worship is a posture of our hearts. You know, saying, we believe in you, God, who you are, and we love you for that, because of that. Have you ever been tired of singing the same things over, same songs over and over? I've been there. But worship is not about the songs in themselves. It's about you and I, individually and together, just loving him and connecting with him because he's worthy. I heard someone say, you know, worship is not a song that's sung, it's a heart that sings. When we worship with this in mind, it really doesn't matter what songs we're singing because he is with us and we belong to him. This is worship. Everything else is an expression of that. Our actions, which can be music, but again, worship is not music per se, and our thoughts and sometimes even our feelings can be worship. So that's my heart for the church, not only for our, our local church, but uh, for the church across the world that, you know, that is people would gather to worship simply because they are called to love him and in turn be really good at receiving his love. Uh, you know, not because the, of the new worship song that, that's on the top 40. You know, what an awesome picture that is. So now we have a foundation of worship, and now we can continue. Uh, I've got a lot of notes, um, and I'm going to go through a lot of points. Um, but I encourage you, if something has uh, really stood out to you, you know, write it down so you remember it. Because for me, if someone has at least one takeaway, um, then that's great. So here we go. Number one, the purpose of worship is to meet with God. Worship is about his presence. Talking about the presence is a whole other message, or even several messages. Uh, so I'll keep this point really brief. Worship, we worship a living God, not a dead one. I'll say that again. We worship a living God and not a dead one. Let's not oversimplify or take this for granted. Knowing that God is alive is reason enough to worship. That here and now, he's with us. He's with us even now, uh, even with you, wherever you're tuning in from this morning. You know, I could just end this teaching right now with that point. God is with us. That is reason enough to worship. God's presence is at the core of why we worship. Like I said earlier, we were created for worship. God has always wanted people to be with and for them to be with him. That's why he created us. He wants to meet with us, speak with us, show us things, do life with us. And that all happens in worship. As we worship, he is with us. The King of glory, the Most High, the Creator, the Redeemer, all that he is, is with us. This is why we are alive, to worship him in the beauty and the splendor of his presence. There's a song we started singing uh, recently that says, in your presence we come alive. And that's so true. True worship is not worship without the presence of God. Personally, this means that, uh, you know, just being aware of him, as we go about our days, focusing on him, loving him, and knowing that he's with us wherever we go. You know, corporately, this means that as we come together as a church, as we worship, our hearts are ready to meet with him, expecting him to come and to be with us in a real way. We worship him in his presence. You know, as I said, worship is not music, but music is an expression of worship. You know, if there is no, even right now as I'm speaking, even if there is no, uh, you know, no sound, no lights, no sound system, nothing, you know, nothing on the screen, there would be just me and God, just us and God. And that's worship. It's all about his presence. The purpose of gathering together is that he's there with us. Jesus says in Matthew 18, verse 20, 
For where two or three are gathered, I'll be there with them. When they're gathered in my name, I will be there with them. When we are gathered together in worship, we can experience this reality that God is with us as we worship him. Yes, God is omnipresent, which means God is in everywhere. God is everywhere. But I believe that there are levels of God's presence that are very real and tangible. I believe that as we gather together, we can actually sense, either in our spirits or even physically, when God comes and we feel he's with us. And it's when he's with us in this tangible way that we are called, that, sorry, that we are changed and God can do what he wants to do. You know, all the things that we're believing for, for, for our church community here at Salem, you know, signs, wonders, and miracles happen when God is in the room and we worship him. One of the most beautiful promises in scripture is James 4, 8. Draw near to God, he will draw near to you. As we worship, as we love God, he responds. Point number two. The purpose of worship is to love God. I mentioned this already, that worship is giving worth to God because we love him. But it's true also that once we worship him, our love for him, I believe, actually continues to grow more and more all the time. And that's how I think our relationship with God should be. That we grow deeper in love with him. Our desire to worship should increase more and more. Just as love grows in relationship, you know, the same is with God. Practically, this means, you know, as we love God, as we put him first in everything, you know, God is sovereign and he wants to be the only one that we worship. And this even means not only taking time out of our day to spend with him, but to put him first, even in our decision making. Just like a marriage, it's not enough to say to my wife, you know, I love you. What good is that without an expression or, or, you know, a response to those words? So I want to ask us that in the last 24 hours, have our lives been worshipped to God? Have we put God first in everything? Or have we avoided him at some point or in some area? In each of our lives, as we worship him, are we putting him first? Do we really love him? Now, we can also love God as we gather together. And actually, as we gather together, you know, as we serve one another, as we are loving one another, um, we are actually serving and loving the Lord at the same time. Jesus tells us the two greatest commandments. The first is to love God, and the second is to love people. Is it possible to love people more than God? Yes. Is it possible to love God without loving people? No. Our love for God should be evident in our love for people. In other words, even when we love God, we will love people. So as we go about our lives putting God first, as we gather together, it should be a natural overflow to serve and love one another. And this is worship to God. As we love others, we are loving him at the same time. And that is so cool. Number three, we worship to know him more. As we seek him with all our hearts in worship, God begins to show himself to us. As he shows himself, we'll want to worship him more. And as we worship him more, we'll want to know him more. God wants us to know him truly for who he is. As a good God, as a father, as a friend. All that he is, he wants us to know. And I believe that we'll see him in all his glory in heaven. I fully believe this. But, you know, because in heaven, there's never-ending worship. But that doesn't mean we can't start right now. There's a level of knowing God that he wants us to experience here in this life. When we gather together in worship, we are displaying God's heart. God's heart is for family and community. And he loves when we worship together as a church. 
And when we gather together, each one of us, I believe, is actually displaying a part of who God is. I believe there's so much diversity in the body of Christ because God is so big and multifaceted and God wants to be displayed through his people. That's why there's so much diversity amongst us. Number four, we worship because we trust him. Did you know that trust is worship? We can't always trust our feelings, but we can trust who our God is. And he is worthy of trusting. It's not always wise to trust people, but Jesus is someone that we can always trust. The last point we looked at was about knowing God. And I believe this is where trust comes from. It's easy to trust someone that you know and love. The more we know him, the easier it is to trust and to trust in his word. One of the things I say as I worship, you know, I say to the Lord, God, who do you want to be for me today? And when he tells me, I can trust him to be that for me. You know, if he wants to be that, that father for me, I can trust him to be my father. Whoever he wants to be. I can also trust his leading in my life. One of the things about worship that I strongly believe is that much like prayer, worship is a two-way thing. I believe as we worship, that as we seek his face in worship, he begins to speak and reveal things. Words of identity, words of direction, you know, words that just build us up. This is also true corporately. I believe a worshiping church whose core value is the presence of God, I can say that that is a healthy church. A church that worships will have God's heart in mind and desire his leading. A worshiping church can trust God's plan for them and not just follow their own program or own way of doing things. This is God's model for the church, a church that trusts in him for direction. The truth is that people will fail, but God never will. His faithfulness is so beautiful. Number five, the purpose of worship is to build us up and help us grow. The truth is God is good and he always will be. The first and last, the almighty God. And God is pretty confident in his identity. See, God commands our worship and he needs our worship, but he doesn't need it. Does that make sense? Like God is God. And so because he's God, he can actually worship himself. But I believe that as we worship, as we give him worth through our love and devotion, as we praise him for who he is, thank him for what he's done, as we do this, we are literally strengthened on the inside. Something really special happens to us when we worship him. You know, as we go about our day, we can, we can simply say, praise you, God, or thank you, Jesus. Even though we're, you know, in the grocery store, you know, thank you, Jesus. And see how it makes you feel. You know, it makes you feel pretty good, right? Worship is good for our health. As we worship, God works on our hearts as well. We're humbled in his presence. God can begin to clean and heal the wounds of hurt and offense that have been built up around us. As we worship, we begin to see that we don't need to have all the answers, but just to be aware of our constant need for him at all times in our lives. The key to worship is to be real and authentic, just as you are, no matter what you're going through. This is the place where God can begin to work on our hearts. This is the place where true worship comes out of, you know, a real, honest, authentic place. When we desire God above the answers that we seek, things break off of us and we can be changed from the inside out. You know, when, when my dad died or when I got sick and had surgery, I could have left my faith in God, but I continued to trust him. I knew who he was in that time. I know him as the healer, but for some reason he didn't heal in that situation. 
but I chose to worship him regardless. I continued to love him regardless of what I had gone through. I couldn't hide anything from him. He knew what he was feeling. He knew my pain. And I want to tell you right now, if you're in a painful situation, worship is the best thing you can do. Being broken before the Lord is the best place you can be. He knows what you're going through. He knows every thought you have. Release the pain in worship to him. Surrender it all to him and just love him through it all. Always be broken before the Lord and surrender. Turn every thought, turn everything in your life back to him in worship. Choose to focus on who God is rather than what you're facing. I'm going to repeat that again. Choose to focus on who God is rather than what you're facing. There's something beautiful about us being in a place of saying, God, I need you. And at the same time saying, God, I love you. When we wake up in the morning, we can say, Lord, today's a new day. I'm going to worship you regardless of what I'm going through or regardless of what I might face today. And when we gather, can we just worship together as a church, knowing that we don't have to have it all, all together? That's when we, when we gather, can, can we be really real with ourselves? You know, let's just be ourselves as we gather together. You know, let's not try and impress each other. Let's worship together in unity. You know, as I say, we're, we're all on a journey together. If our worship as a church is not authentic, I'm sorry to say, but it doesn't really please God. I believe it doesn't. It's like Paul said, you know, just like, you know, in the, in the love chapter in Corinthians, you know, it just becomes this clanging symbol, just noise to God. Because when we gather together in unity and worship our creator together, how special is that? You just feel his presence in the room and God touches us as his body and we leave the building better than we came. But my favorite times in worship has been these times where everyone is just lifting up one voice unto the Lord. Not just some, but everyone, free of distraction and other things. Giving God what he's worth, no matter what people are going through. And then imagine everything that God is doing in hearts and lives during that moment. It's just awesome. One last thought I want to end with. So we've looked at the purpose or the why of worship both individually and corporately. But I want to close by saying that we can't have one without the other. We can't have individual worship without the corporate worship. It's so important that we gather together to love and serve God as a church. But I believe that can't fully happen if we don't live our lives in worship throughout the week, remaining connected with God. We're created to worship. We are called to desire him and remain connected 24-7. And then what happens when we gather together will be a natural overflow from the rest of the week. You know, this, of course, this is a work in progress. You know, there's always room to grow. There's room for me to grow. There's room for you to grow. There's room for us as a church to grow. But that's always the goal for us individually and as a church to worship him with all our hearts. Worship is about loving God because he's worthy and then receiving his love for us. So God, right now in this moment, wherever each one of us are, we want to take this time just to focus on you, God, and to worship you, to love you, to say you are worthy of our full attention in this moment. We thank you for who you are. And we thank you that you are a loving God, a loving, faithful Father who loves us and we receive your love in this moment. I want us to ask a question as well. And I want us to ask this question. God, what were you thinking when you created me?
And so God, from this, we worship you. From our identity, who you, who you created us to be, we worship you. And we don't want to take the love that you have for us for granted. We don't want to let a bad day or a bad morning get in the way of our worship to you. We want to love you, God, and receive more of your love today. In Jesus' name, amen.
We're going to close with this last song. This is Amazing Grace. So who breaks? Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty and so much stronger? The King of glory, the King above all kings. Who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder? Who leaves us breathless in awe and wonder? The King of glory, the King above all kings. 
This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You will lay down your life. Then I would be set free. I sing for all that you've done for me. Who brings our chaos back into order? Who makes the orphan, the son and daughter, the king of glory, the king above? Truth and justice shines like the sun in all of its brilliance. King of glory, King above all kings. Oh, this is amazing grace. Oh, this is a failing love. You will take my place. Worthy, worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Oh, and worthy. for all that you've done for me.